man, I want to shave Brian's head. I'd give anything, anything for that privilege. The first 20 years of my ministry life, I worked up on the college campus, and our vision and mission around what we did there is we wanted everyone to get an opportunity to hear the gospel. We wanted everyone to have a chance to know who Jesus was and what it was that he did for them. So over the course of that 20 years, that meant that I had hundreds and hundreds of individual conversations with college students, probably even thousands over that 20 years. And when you walk into those conversations, you really don't know what a person's understanding of the gospel message is. So there was a couple questions that we would ask students to help us understand what do they really know about the gospel. Here's what we would ask them. We would say simply, if you were to die today and you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? And then the follow-up question to that, how confident are you in your answer? 10 being that I'm absolutely confident that my answer would get me in and one being I have absolutely no hope that my answer would get me in. I want you just for a second to stop and ask yourself those two questions. If you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And how confident are you in your answer? And you can imagine over hundreds and hundreds of conversations, I probably just heard an incredible spectrum of answers. Sometimes people are like, I, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Or I don't know, but I sure hope that somehow God would let me in. Oftentimes, the answers would be clustered around certain things that people would say like, I've always tried to, and then they would fill in the blank with something that they thought would be a good answer for God. They would say things like, well, I've never and then they fill in the blank with something. I've done my best to blank. All of these answers, if I could put them in, in kind of a pot together, it's kind of this idea that I've lived a good life. Somehow I believe that I've lived a good enough life that if I hand my test into God and he grades my test, that somehow I'm gonna get a passing grade. Some people were like, man, I just hope God curves the final. You know, that was like always hoping for a curve on those tests. Does God curve the final? My story, I grew up attending church. My mom took me to church when I was in middle school and high school. And I would just say this, I wasn't one of those kids that had to be drugged to church. I actually enjoyed going to church. She took me to a great church with a great Bible teacher I would say, if, you were, if I were to describe my heart, I had a fond affection for Jesus. But if you were to press me and to ask me, Bob, because of your affection for Jesus, did you orient your life around him? I would say, no, absolutely not. But if you were to ask me, Bob, are you a Christian? I would say, 100%, I am a Christian. I would raise my hand. But for me, I had the opportunity as a sophomore in college that another student sat down with me and he asked me those two questions. If you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? I didn't know how to explain it. I talked about what I felt like I had done to try to earn God's favor. And I remember he asked me, on a scale of one to 10, and I still remember writing down my answer. My number was seven. And you know what? I was lying. I was, I was just like, man, I don't think I have a prayer. Five would be the best 50-50, but I don't want to look bad in front of him. So I said seven. I didn't know. And here's the assumption that I make for everyone in this room and everyone that's watching online. I don't assume that just because you attend church that you know how to answer those questions. Because I attended church for so many years of my life and I didn't get it. And it wasn't integrated into my life. And now when I say that, I'm not saying that you aren't smart people. This is a room full of smart people and many people watching online that are way smarter than I am. But here's what I believe to be true. And it scares me to death. Is that there are people sitting in this room, there are people watching online, that think that they are right with God and they're not. 
They think that they're right with God and they're not. They're not ready to face that day of judgment that we're all gonna face, every one of us. You, me, every one of us are gonna stand before God and give an account for our life. They're not ready to face that judgment. What I wanna do is I wanna start out by looking at a scripture that for me has been incredibly unsettling over the years, but I think it's important. And here's my hope, is that we start to look at this text a little bit, that maybe it will unsettle us a little bit today too. This text comes from the very end of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter seven, one of Jesus' most famous sermons, but he's talking about that day of judgment standing before him. Here's what the scripture says. Matthew chapter seven, starting in verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is why this is so unsettling to me. They seemed so confident, but they missed something. What is it that they didn't get? What is it that they missed about the gospel message that caused Jesus to say, I never knew you? I mean, it looks so good. I mean, they address Jesus as Lord. That word kurios, Lord, master. They knew who he was. They ascribed honor to him. You are the Lord. And the way they said it, Lord, Lord, In that culture, when you wanted to emphasize something, you repeated it. They're not just saying, Lord. They're saying, Lord, Lord. They're being emphatic about it. This is what we believe to be true. Lord, Lord. They seem sincere. They seem passionate. And here's what's crazy to me. They did good things on the outside. So that they they prophesied. Meaning that they spoke for God boldly spoke for God. They drove out demons, pushing back darkness. They performed miracles, all the different signs of the kingdom. But in the very end, Jesus said, I don't know you. Away from me. Now, Jesus isn't saying that he doesn't know who they are. He knows everyone. But what he's trying to get across is, I didn't know you in a relational sense. We didn't have that covenant relationship with one another. You weren't one of mine. And that's why this text to me is so terrifying. What did they miss? What could I be missing? What maybe could you be missing? And here's why I think this message, this series is so important. I don't want you to walk out of these doors or close your computer and walk out of here wondering, Do I know? Can I just hope for, wish for, cross my fingers behind my back, hoping that I will spend eternity with God? Or can we know now? Can we know now what it is that God is asking of us? I want us to be prepared for that day that all of us are gonna have when we stand before him. We need to have an understanding of the gospel message. When I talk about this idea of the gospel, I'm talking about God's redeeming work to bring people into that kind of covenant relationship with him. So many times when we think about the gospel, we we think primarily just about the, the New Testament, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus as the kind of the culmination or that central point of salvation. But I want you to understand that this idea that God is a covenant-making God, he wants that covenant relationship, and that was true from the very beginning. So I want to take us to a story way back in Genesis that I think does an amazing job of helping us understand what is the central essence of the gospel. What is this covenant heart 
that God has for his people. We're going to be looking at Genesis 15, but I want to let you know that in Genesis 12, God makes a covenant promise to Abram. He says, there's three things, Abram, that I'm going to promise to you. I'm going to promise you land, a land that will belong to you and your people. I'm going to give you a nation, many descendants. And he said, I'm going to promise you a blessing that Abraham, I am going to bless you. And through that blessing is going to bring redemption to the entire world. Abram understands that God has made this covenant with him. But when we get to Genesis 15, Abraham raises his hand and he's got a question. God, how can I know? How can I know, God, that you will keep your commitment? And I'm gonna read this text of scripture, then I'm gonna unpack it a little bit with you so we can understand the cultural insight around this. Because if you just read this story, it may not make sense to you. But you'll understand the covenant nature of the heart of God. Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 8. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? He's talking about that covenant, that covenant promise of God. What is your commitment to me? Is what Abram is saying. So here's how the Lord responds. He said, So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him. And here's what Abram did. It says that he cut them in two and arranged the halves on opposite, op, the halves opposite of each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham, Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting... Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, here's the promise of the covenant, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation that they serve as slaves, and afterward, They will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Here's the punchline. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. What? That's crazy. Like, what what is going on there? Why would you say that's one of the most clearest Old Testament explanations of the gospel? What we need to understand is what is happening here. This is what they would call a covenant renewal ceremony or a covenant ratification ceremony. And here's the significance of that. Probably the the closest thing that we have in our culture to a covenant would be a marriage covenant. And I get the chance, I've had the chance to do lots of weddings and after all the I do's have been said and everyone walks back out, I follow the couple and I go and I take a marriage license and they sign a marriage license and their witnesses sign the marriage license and I put my signature at the very bottom. It's how we ratify a covenant. We just simply sign it. But we're in a written culture. Abram is in a oral culture. So how do they ratify a covenant? They do a covenant ratification ceremony. And here's the picture of what's happening. Rather than just sign a piece of paper, what they do is they act out both the blessing and the curse of the covenant. Abram knew exactly what was happening. When he said, when the Lord said to him, bring those animals, he knew exactly what to do. He knew that you need to tear them in half and split and make a walkway in between. All of those animals spread apart. And what he was doing was saying, this is the curse of the covenant. If you don't hold to what your part of the covenant is, 
You are gonna be torn to pieces and the birds of the air are gonna come and prey on your body. Pretty significant. Not just signing a little piece of paper. Abram knows that this is what God is saying. God says, if I don't keep my part of the covenant, I will be torn to pieces. If you don't keep your piece of the covenant, you will be torn to pieces. That is the normal thing that would happen. But here's what's crazy and unexpected about what happened here. God does something that was completely unexpected. Verse 12, remember it says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then God describes the blessing of the covenant. But then in verse 17, he says this, when the sun had set and the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. That fire, that smoke, that is a symbol of the presence of God. All throughout the Old Testament, whether there was a, a burning bush with Moses or fire coming down on Mount Sinai or the pillar of fire and the cloud by day that the nation of Israel, this meant the presence of God. Here's what happened. The pieces were torn apart and God walked through the pieces. Abraham didn't walk through the pieces. Why is that so significant? What was God trying to say? God was saying that I am making the covenant promise for both of us. I'm making the covenant promise for both of us. What God is saying is that I will be torn to pieces if I don't keep my promise and I will be torn to pieces if you don't keep your promise to me. I will bless you, even if it means I'm torn to pieces for your failure. You see the beautiful picture there. If you've been around church, you see the foreshadowing of what this is talking about. It is talking about the reality that when we get to the New Testament, not the Abrahamic covenant, but the new covenant in Christ. Christ took the curse of the covenant for us. He walked through the pieces for us. He was willing to be torn apart for us. We didn't walk through. He walked through alone. When his body was beaten and ripped apart till the insides could be seen, when that crown of thorns was put on his head, flesh ripped apart. When there was a spear that was rammed up through his side, flesh torn apart. Hands nailed to a cross. Feet nailed to a cross. He was willing to be torn apart for us. He fulfilled the blessing and the curse for us. I don't care how long you've been around church. The message of what God has done for us has got to move our heart and melt our heart in gratitude. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion out there. Because religion, in its essence, says that it is your obedience, it is what you do, it is you bringing your resume to God that makes you acceptable to him. Christianity turns that completely on its head, and it's completely the opposite. The gospel message is that God has made you acceptable because of what he has done for you, not because of anything that you've done for him. And out of our gratitude, out of our gratitude for what he has done for us, we live a life of obedience. We follow him and we say thank you day after day because of what he has done for us. This seems like such a simple message, friends, but we miss it so often. 
That's why the scripture tells us we have got to preach this message. Not only to the world out there, friends, we need to preach this to each other. We need to be reminded moment by moment, day by day, of the magnitude of what God has done for us because it's only when we understand that that we'll live the kind of life out of gratitude that God wants us to live. All throughout scripture, the gospel writer John helps us this in 1 John chapter four to understand that it's our acceptance that comes first and then our obedience. This is what John says, 1 John four, starting in verse 16. He says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. What is it that we know and rely and we put all of our weight on? Our love for God, our obedience to God. No, God's love for us, what he has done for us. And then he continues, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And I love verse 17. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Before I go on, I feel like there's sometimes that we think that because our acceptance comes first that it doesn't matter what we do. It lowers the bar of obedience. Listen to what John says. This is how we can have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. We're like Jesus. Is that lowering the bar of obedience? Not even close. It is raising the bar. Our life is to look like the life of Jesus lived out in gratitude to God for what he has done for us. And he says, here's the response. There is no fear in love. We don't have to fear in love, in God's love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. God goes first. God goes first. He went through the pieces for us. Jesus went through the pieces for us. And the only way that we're able to love God is when we've had an incredible experience of the love of God for us. And here's the result. As John continues a few verses later, 1 John 5, 3, he says, in fact, this is love for God to keep his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Why are they not burdensome? Because we're not trying to earn anything. This is the beautiful message of the gospel. This is what needs to go to the deepest places of who we are. How do you know if these things are being internalized in your life? If your life is being oriented around this good news of the gospel? Are we, are, are we thinking religious? Type people, or are we gospel people? Can I tell you what is true of religious people? Religious people, there's a lot of fear and anxiety when they think about standing before God because they're always asking the question, have I done enough? Is my resume complete enough? And there's always this sense of comparison they try to compare themselves to other people. How am I doing with others? And they see other people doing better and it leads to despair and insecurity. That's what happens to religious people. And it causes us to move away from the giver of life. Because if we think we have to earn something before God, it makes God a taskmaster rather than a loving father. And when we think of God as a taskmaster, we don't love him. We actually grow to resent him. Religious people can grow to resent God. You know what else is true of religious people? They have a sense of entitlement. They think they're entitled for this reason. If I do my part, if I can earn something before God, that means that God has to do his part. 
I want the life that I think I deserve if I do what I think I need to do. I hear so many people as they're walking away from faith. It's just like, why would you walk away from God? He didn't do what I thought he should do for me. I did all this and he didn't do for me what I wanted in this life. And it just exposes religious people. They just see God as a means to an end rather than the ultimate end in and of himself. And there are teachers all over this country, all over this world that stand on stages just like this and say, God owes you. He owes you stuff in this life. He owes you things in this life. He owes you the life that you want. That's not the gospel. God doesn't owe us anything, but we just respond to him out of gratitude. You know what else is true of religious people? There's pride. They're proud people, because if they think that they're doing well, if, if you don't think that you're doing well, you can lead to despair and insecurity, but if you think you're doing great, what it means is I start to look down on other people. It creates judgment in other people. I start to look at people maybe that are irreligious or outside of the gospel with contempt. Like they're the problem with this world. I hear Christians, people that claim to be followers of Christ, they look out at the world and the things that are happening in this world and they're angry at people. They're like, they're what's wrong with this world. They are, they almost talk about these people as if they're the enemy of the gospel. Friends, they are not the enemy of the gospel. They are the audience for the gospel. They're the ones that God came to save. When we're religious, we can be proud and we can be judgmental. And all it does is show that we don't understand the gospel. That's why we have got to preach the gospel to ourselves, to each other. But if we start to engage with this message of the gospel and it starts to become part of the fabric of who we are, what are we gonna see in our life? People that are gospel-centered people, you know what you're gonna see in, your life, in their life? You're gonna see peace. You're gonna see peace because they know God's got me. He made a commitment to me and his promises are good. There's a sense of peace even in the midst of suffering in this world. Gospel-centered people, they're humble because they know I did nothing to deserve what God did for me. I am just grateful. And they see other people as deserving. And people that maybe don't know who God is and what he's done for them. There's compassion for them, not resentment toward them. Gospel-centered people are humble. You know what else is true? They're authentic. Gospel-centered people are authentic. They're willing to let their life be shown for what it is. They know that they don't need to hide because they know that the God of the universe that loves them and walked through the pieces for them knows everything that's happening in their life. And he was willing to die for them anyway. We don't have to hide because God knows it. Other people can know it. I don't have to put on airs. People that know the gospel are authentic. You know what else is true of people that know the gospel? They actually share the gospel with other people. They know that this is good news. Like Romans 1.16 says, this is the, the gospel is the power of salvation. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes they share the gospel because their life has been so encountered by the love of God that they want other people to know it as well. This week I was in a prayer meeting with a group of people and a lot of those people aren't from our church, but we're, we get together every Tuesday morning and we're just praying that God would pour out his spirit on our valley and all of the churches. We need God to move in and through all of the churches. When we got done, she was sitting next to me and she looked over at me and she just had this beautiful smile on her face and she said, Thank you for what Journey Church is doing. You guys are doing a great job. And I was like, 
What does that, what does that mean? Why would you say that? She said, I just want to let you know what happened to me this last week. She said, I was at the hairdresser. My hairdresser started to talk with me about Jesus so boldly and unashamed, sharing with me about who Jesus was. And she said, it just, it caught me off guard, but I was so thankful. But I asked her, where do you go to church? She said, I go to Journey Church. And my friend told me that later that week, she said, I was at a doctor's appointment and there was a nurse that came in and the nurse just said, I, I just want to tell you that I am a woman of faith and I put my trust in Jesus and I want to talk to you about Jesus. And she was blown away again that this woman would so boldly talk to her about Jesus. And she said, can I just ask you, where do you go to church? And she said, I go to Journey Church. I don't know who you are. I don't know who this hairdresser is. I don't know who this nurse is, but I want to be like you. And I want more people in our church to be like you. That we would say, this is such good news to me that I am willing to share this good news with anyone. I want us to be like them. People of the good news share the good news. As we wrap up, I just want to ask this question. I want you to think about this. Where are you at with God right now? If you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? Are you confident in your answer? And maybe some of you are asking, how do I, how do I step into this covenant relationship with God? This covenant, how do I make Christ's death apply to me? The Bible makes it as clear as possible. Two words, you repent and you believe. Repentance and faith, those two things. And it's actually not two things, it's two sides of the same coin. On the one side, we say our faith, or our trust. We're putting our faith and our trust in what Jesus did for us. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we deserve to die. We say we are grabbing a hold of that. We are turning to him in faith. And as we are turning to him in faith, that word repentance means that there's something that we are turning away from. We're turning away from a self-centered life, a life of sin that says, I want to do life my way, God, not your way. A person that repents is someone that is willing to say, I hate my sin. And by God's grace, I am willing to forsake my sin. I want to walk away from it. It's that simple. The difference between a believer and an unbeliever is not that one has sins and one doesn't have sins, but it has to do with what are we grabbing onto in this life? An unbeliever is simply holding on to their life, their life of sin, and with this hand, they're trying to push away God who's trying to wrestle that sin away from them because he knows that that's what's killing them. Let me take that from you. That is the picture of an unbeliever. But a believer is simply one that just says, God, I am grabbing a hold of you. I'm putting my trust in you. And with this hand, I am pushing away sin because I'm realizing that that is killing me. It is keeping me from the life that you have for me. Where are you at today? Do you feel confident? standing before Jesus and giving an account for your life. Can you tell him with confidence what it is that you have grabbed a hold of in this life? When you stand before him, what are you going to point to? Are you going to point to your test score? Are you going to point to your resume? Here's what I did. Here's what I didn't do. Or are you going to point to Jesus? It's the only hope that we have is to point to Jesus and grabbing a hold of him in faith and in repentance. For some of you, maybe there's been a stirring, even as we've talked about this, because you walked in and you said, I don't know. I don't know where I would be if I stood before God, but I want to. Here's what I'm going to do with you. In just a few moments, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if that's the desire of your heart, to let go of sin and to grab a hold of Jesus. I just want you to, in your heart, pray that along with me. 
surrendering your life to him. Don't wait. Maybe today is your day. Let's pray. Jesus, I just want to thank you that you were willing to walk through the pieces for us, for me. Jesus, thank you that you were torn apart to pay the penalty for my sin. Jesus, I don't look at my righteousness. Jesus, I look at your righteousness. Thank you that you died in my place to pay the penalty for my sin. And today, Jesus, I am grabbing a hold of you. I want my life to belong to you. I'm renouncing my self-centered life. I want everything to orient around you. Jesus, make me right. Not because of what I've done, but because of what you've done. And Jesus, we just say thank you to you in your powerful and resurrected name. And all God's people said, amen. I just wanna invite you, if you've made a decision like that, whether it was today or if it's a decision that you've made in the past, one of the things that the Bible tells us to plant a stake in the ground to mark the reality that we've given our life to him is what the Bible calls baptism. It is, a, it is a public proclamation for us of a new identification saying, we belong to him now. We are his now. Just wanna let you know that on November 14th, two weeks from today, we're gonna be having a baptism service. It's a big deal around here because we believe driving that stake in the ground and saying that I am a follower of Jesus is one of the most important things that we can do, and we love to get to do that together. If you have not, if you are a follower of Jesus, you've made that commitment, but you've not been baptized, I want you to take that QR code that's on the chair back in front of you. You can scan that and sign up to be baptized on November 14th. It is gonna be a party. Let's worship. Thanks for engaging with this content. If it was encouraging to you, we'd love for you to leave a review. Hit that subscribe button and share this content with others. We'd also love to connect with you. The best place to do that is journeyweb.net. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search Journey Church Bozeman and you'll find us there. If you'd like to give to our ministry, you can do that now at journeyweb.net slash give. Once again, thanks for engaging with Journey Church.